Well, I'm very happy to be here tonight. I want to tell you something about some of the highlights and the discoveries from the Cassini mission. And as well, go back a little bit and talk about what did we know 50 years ago about Saturn and put that then in the context with Cassini. And in fact, I actually started on Cassini in 1988 before Cassini even had a name or was officially a NASA mission. I was still working on Voyager, but I had a chance to look into the future for this new mission called Cassini. And in fact, my oldest daughter, Jennifer, had just started kindergarten when I started working on Cassini. And now she's grown and married and has a daughter of her own. How time flies. And I tell people, you know it takes Saturn 30 years to circle the sun a single time? That's how long I've worked on Cassini. One Saturn year. <laughs> so, so many of the discoveries made by Cassini have really changed, revolutionized our understanding of the planet itself, of the complex and beautiful rings and the dynamic moons, as well as the magnetic environment around the planet. And up here is one of my favorite photographs, and I'll be talking some more about it. It's actually a montage of over 100 pictures. And this is a solar eclipse. Saturn is covering up the sun, and you can see all of the rings glowing around the planet. And I'll, and I'll get to that a bit more uh, in my talk. Well, first of all, why explore the planets? What's, what's our motivation? Well, there are some grand science questions that have been defined, and one of those are, are we alone in the universe? Has life originated somewhere other than on the Earth? And how did life originate on our own planet? Another one of the grand science questions is, how did the solar system and the Earth within it come to be? How, does, how is it evolving, and where is it headed? What you see on this slide are the eight planets in our solar system. Going out from the sun, you can see Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, and then Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Saturn is a sixth planet out from the sun. It's ten times further from the sun than the Earth is, and takes about 30 years, as I said, to circle the sun a single time. So how big is Saturn anyway? We call it a gas giant, and to put it in context, here you can see the Earth and the Moon to scale and the distance between them. And if you were to put Saturn in the same scale, Saturn and the rings would fit between the Earth and the Moon. In fact, it would take 764 Earths, if Earth were a tiny marble, to fit inside and fill up Saturn. So Saturn is truly a gas giant planet, an atmosphere made mostly of hydrogen and helium. Well, stepping back 50 years, what did we know about Saturn and the rings 50 years ago? Well, as I said, second largest planet, orbits the sun about once every 30 years. No solid surface, mostly made of hydrogen with some helium, a lot of the same ingredients as the sun. It was the only known planet at that time with a ring system, and the rings were actually discovered by Galileo in 1610 when he pointed his telescope at Saturn. What I have there is a drawing from his notebook. He thought Saturn's rings initially were two moons, one on either side of Saturn. But he was very surprised as he looked night after night, unlike Jupiter's moons, which moved around. These two objects stayed at the same place around Saturn. And it wasn't until much later that we thought of the rings as a disk and now know that they're made of individual particles. Well, 50 years ago, we knew about the classic rings around Saturn that you'd see in a telescope. A, B, C, and D. And in the late 1960s, a discovery had been made with the ring's edge onto the sun of the E-ring, that bright bluish ring that was in the first, that earlier photograph. Also, we knew they were made of individual ice particles. For the first time, measurements were made that water ice was the main composition of the rings. Uh, the ring thickness at that time, again, from these edge-on measurements, we thought about maybe a mile and a half thick. And that's amazing considering they're tens of thousands of miles across. And there are also two gaps we could see in the rings, the Cassini division, named after our mission has the name of the scientist who discovered that gap in the rings, and then the Enki gap. But what about the moons? Well, 50 years ago, we knew about the nine mid-sized moons uh, that you, you orbit Saturn in a similar direction and in Saturn's equatorial plane. The late 1960s had just discovered two co-orbital moons, Janus and Epimetheus share an orbit also had discovered that Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, had a dense atmosphere and that it contained methane. 
that spectrographic observation showed methane as one of the components. And the moon Iapetus, we knew, had one very dark side and one very bright side. On the 50 years that have passed, what we've done is we've used ground-based telescopes, and these are just two examples, the, the IRTF and the Keck Observatory, to look at Saturn and the Rings in more detail and learn more about these places. And there's some of the data from each of these observatories uh, shown on the right. We've also transitioned to space-based telescopes. Get above the Earth's atmosphere, you have a much better window over which you can observe. You don't have the atmospheric effects in the way. Hubble, there's a couple of Hubble images on the top. IUE, the International Ultraviolet Explorer, Spitzer Space Telescope, and the Chandra X-ray Observatory have all looked at Saturn at various times and increased our knowledge. But it really started about 40 years ago when we actually started sending spacecraft to Saturn, that our knowledge really started to increase. And so the first flyby of Saturn was in September 1979 by Pioneer 11. There's a Pioneer 11 picture. Voyager 1 and 2, a flyby of Voyager 1 in November 1980, and Voyager 2, August 1981. And there's a montage uh, from the Voyager studies. And then finally, Cassini arriving at Saturn in 2004. That's almost 25 years after Voyager. And there are some of the images of some of the data that came back from Cassini. Well, at one of our science meetings, I just, as we were taking pictures of the group, I said, let's get everyone together on Cassini who also worked on Voyager. And so there's about 30 scientists. Not all of them were there in the picture. I mean, Paul could have, <laughs> would, would have been one of them in this picture as well. Uh, who worked on the, on the Voyager missions. And actually, I was one of the youngest people at that point in 1977, uh, beginning to work on Voyager right at the time that it launched. Well, transitioning now to Cassini, here's the NASA Cassini orbiter. It's about the size of a two-story building. You can see some people in that image on the left, the scale. Uh, the Cassini orbiter carried the European Space Agency's Huygens probe. Uh, the Huygens probe was a passenger. We dropped off Huygens to parachute down through the atmosphere of Titan and land on the surface. And uh, you can see it's getting, getting covered up with gold foil. We went in as close to Venus, so we had to have a very reflective spacecraft to keep it from overheating. And it's why it's all in gold-colored blankets rather than in the typical black blankets. And you can see the heat shield for Huygens underneath it. Uh, you can see the high gain antenna at the top, the Italian Space Agency, that white antenna at the top of Cassini, uh, the Italians provided that as well. Now, you'll notice Cassini doesn't have solar panels. Ra three radioisotope thermoelectric generators use the heat generated from plutonium to turn that heat energy into electricity. And the amount of power for Cassini is about what you have for the light bulb in your refrigerator to run all of the instruments and the computers on board Cassini. Well, my daughters were growing up during that time, and this is from a, an old newspaper photograph. Paul has some of the only photographs of me in this time period uh, for our Take Your Daughter to Work Day. And here Jessica and I are in our little bunny suits uh, as Cassini was being built at JPL. These are the 19 countries who provided scientists or engineers or instruments to the Cassini project, truly an international mission. And we would have two meetings a year in the United States and one meeting a year, usually in one of the participating countries. T minus video 15 of seconds. the launch. T minus 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion mile trek to Saturn. Pitch program is in, roll program is in. We have cleared the tower, and the Cassini spacecraft is on its way to Saturn. T plus 20 seconds, all systems are go. Jupiter Inlet Tracking Station now acquiring data. All systems go.
Cassini was launched in October of 1997, and we took our daughters out of school to come with us to the Cape to see the launch. And we got down there, and I said, well, I got you know, teenage daughters. Got some bad news for you. The Cassini launch is pre-dawn, and we're going to have to get up awfully early to go see the launch. And they were, they were good sports about it. They enjoyed, the, I think, the week out of school. But as we stood there, you could first see the Cassini spacecraft begin to lift up off the pad, and then those waves of sound hit you, just the tremendous roar of the launch. And as you could see, Cassini went up into a cloud, and the cloud brightened. I remember the people around me gasped because they thought, what if the rocket had exploded? Uh, but instead, Cassini slowly lifted above the cloud and continued on her journey to Saturn. Here's the Cassini mission, shown against the 30-year orbit orbital period for Saturn. Launched in 1997, arrived at Saturn seven years later. We had gravity assists, basically we used the planets to slingshot us on our way, two of Venus, one of the Earth, and one of Jupiter. <coughs> Arriving in June 2004, the four-year Prime mission was followed by a two-year Equinox mission and a seven-year Solstice mission. At the end of that mission, we had a one-year period where we pulled the orbit in very close and actually dove in between the planet in the rings in that final year. So a very, very exciting end of mission. Here's another way to look at the mission. Uh, those 13 years across the top are the number of orbits and their orientations. We use Titan as our tour engine. Titan's gravity allowed us to change the shape and orientation of the orbit so we could fly by other icy moons. We could look at the poles of Saturn and really gave us a lot of flexibility. Imagine like having an extra giant fuel tank, and that's what Titan represented with those 127 flybys. Early in the mission, we had three close flybys of the tiny moon Enceladus. Enceladus was so exciting, we added 20 more flybys of Enceladus. 15 close flybys of the other icy moons is when you get in really close, to make out the detail that it really gets exciting. And then you can see the Saturn seasons change across the bottom. We arrived in northern winter and were there until northern summer. And then those 22 orbits, proximal or grand finale orbits at the end. Here's all 292 of, and a half of Cassini's orbits. Uh, the gray orbits are early in the mission, and that's when we dropped off the Huygens probe. And then those uh, green orbits are those orbits in the final year of the mission. Looks like a ball of yarn. A little bit about Saturn. We were there, we got to watch the seasons change. Arriving in northern winter, the ring shadow was covering up a lot of the northern hemisphere. And that allowed the hazes, that golden color of Saturn, the hazes dissipated. And you can now see the effects of the bluish color uh, shining through from deeper in the atmosphere. The middle panel is equinox. The rings are edge on. We've actually brightened up the rings so that you could see them. And finally, the ring shadow, like a giant sundial, ring shadow moved to the south as it became winter in the south and summer in the north. At the very north pole, there's a very interesting feature. It's unique in the solar system. It's a six-sided jet stream. We call it the hexagon. It's two Earth diameters across. And you can see inside the hexagon, it's still that blue-greenish color from the haze not yet forming. This is just spring in the northern hemisphere. And here's a movie of the hexagon. You can, in this false color movie, the clouds on the edge of the hexagon race around like horses on a racetrack. And in the very center, in that, that red-shaped object, is a giant hurricane. And here's a blow-up of that hurricane. The sun is shining in from the right. You can actually see the shadows of the eye wall of this hurricane. It's about half the size of the continental United States, with wind speeds about four times greater. And it's right at the North Pole, and so it appears to be a very stable feature. And there's a similar hurricane at the South Pole as well. We were in the right place at the right time. There are giant storms on Saturn. They occur about once every 30 years. Uh, this one came about 20 years earlier, that whitish storm. It actually wrapped completely around the planet. And if you look, this is in the visible. If you look in the near infrared, that greenish cyclone is the head of the storm. Another cyclone was near the tail. And when the two met, that marked the end of the storm about nine months later. This storm released a tremendous amount of energy, as storms tend to do. And that energy went into the upper atmosphere, and in the far infrared, there's the heat energy. It was 80 degrees Kelvin warmer, lots of new chemistry 
as the storm dissipated. It's like Saturn's tremendous, tremendous release of energy. Here is Saturn's ring, simple names. There's the A ring, B ring, C ring, and D ring. These are the rings you see in a telescope. Uh, then the bright E ring, F ring, and G ring. And these are the main uh, rings that we know of about Saturn. And here's a true color image of what the rings look like. The B ring is the brightest and it has the most ring particles. On average, the rings are only about 30 feet thick. So very tiny with particles that range in size from dust grains to mountain-sized particles. Most of them are in the, the few inch size range of particles. I can see that the A ring is a little bit darker. There's micrometeorites that are continually polluting the rings. And there's less material in the A ring, so it looks darker. The C ring is even darker yet. That is by far the most heavily polluted it and the material in the Cassini division uh, for the rings. Here's th that view of Saturn's rings at equinox. Equinox occurs twice every Saturn orbit, so about once every 15 years. And when the sun is edge on to the rings, anything that sticks up above or below that 30 foot thickness of the rings will cast a shadow. And as I said, we've brightened up the, the left hand side by about a factor of 30 on the right-hand side by about a factor of 60, because they're only illuminated now by the light reflected from Saturn. So one of the things we do is we look for those shadows, and here this is the edge of the B-ring near the Cassini division. We saw objects there that cast shadows a mile or two long, objects that were probably as much as a quarter mile in size. Basically, these mountain-sized objects crowded at the edge of the B-ring like, like cars on a crowded freeway. And the analogy for these shadows is imagine you're on the space station and you want to find the pyramids. If you look around noon, the shadows will be very short and they'll blend in with the sandy background uh, around them. But if you look at dawn or dusk, the equivalent of equinox, that's when their shadows are the longest and they're the easiest to see. So for the rings, equinox was the perfect time to look for these shadows and could pinpoint for us where these biggest particles were located. This is one of our highest resolution images of the rings as we got very close in that final year. Uh, one of the bright features in the sea ring, we call it a plateau, has more particles in the surrounding region. And if you subtract out anything that's symmetric in the image, what you're left with is the band in the middle. We saw lots of streaky features, clumping of particles. Uh, these particles stick together and grow into long linear clumps. And they have different textures, you know, streaky or clumpy and places with no texture, and we're still puzzling almost two years later about what these pictures could be telling us about the rings and how they clump and stick together. We also discovered a feature that looked like we were maybe going to see the birth of a new moon. In April 2013, we saw this bright object at the edge of the A-ring. In the little square, the blow-up is in the bigger square, and we a tiny object, we thought we were seeing the birth of a small, icy moon right at the edge of the A-ring. And that moon got the nickname Peggy. It turns out that the scientist who discovered it was his mother-in-law's birthday. On the day he discovered it, so he nicknamed it after her. And she was very proud to have a, a moon-to-be named after her. And for the next four years, we watched to see if Peggy would break free of the rings and become a moon on her own. It didn't happen, but we kept watching. And even the final day of the mission, we took pictures, and sure enough, Peggy was still there hanging on to the outer edge of the A-ring. Next mission, we'll go back. We'll see if there's a new moon at Saturn. Here's that solar eclipse image I was telling you about. This is where Saturn covers up the sun. There's 140 pictures in this mosaic, and we can actually bring our cameras in to look closer to Saturn. You'll notice there's a white halo around Saturn. Sunlight is refracted around through the atmosphere and into Cassini's cameras. And if you think about it, that's every sunrise and sunset on Saturn seen at the very same time. You'll also notice that there's light on the night side of Saturn. That's light reflected from the rings onto the night side of the planet. And then that outermost ring, that E-ring, glowing with tiny particles. And one analogy for the sunlight shining through these tiniest of particles, if you've ever had a dusty windshield on a sunny afternoon as you drive into the sun, all of a sudden it gets harder to see because those small particles are sending light into your eyes. Same thing here for the Cassini cameras. Turns out that there are actually three planets in this picture besides Saturn. 
can see Mars, Venus, and the Earth and Moon. And we spent 20 minutes to get that frame in the lower right. You can see the bluish Earth and the gray Moon. And it turns out in 2013, when we took this set of pictures, we told people, go out and wave at Saturn. How many people waved at Saturn in 2013? I did, I did. Go out and wave at Saturn so that you can be in the picture that Cassini is taking of you from a billion miles away. Now, of course, Cassini isn't resolving any people. That In fact, that Earth is probably only a few picture elements, pixels across. So we said, okay, take a selfie of yourself waving at, the, at, at Saturn with your group or whoever and send us your selfies. And we got selfies from all around the world. It turns out that Saturn was in view from the west coast of the United States through Europe. And so we got pictures from around the world. And we took those selfies. And we recreated that mosaic out of selfies. And this was very popular as the people who had sent us pictures went here to find themselves <laughs> in this. And I did too. My husband and I, we sent our selfie. And we went and we looked for our picture as well. So a very, very uh, popular way to reach out to the public and get them to go to our webpage and learn a lot more about Saturn. We got pictures of people holding their babies up waving at Saturn or their dogs or their all kinds of clubs, all kinds of groups, all you know, waving in that 20-minute window. Moving on to the moons, it turns out we now know there are 62 moons around Saturn, grown quite a bit from 50 years ago. Uh, the largest moon shown there is Titan. Most of the moons that we've discovered are captured moons that are in the outermost part of the Saturn system, and they have inclined and sometimes <coughs> even retrograde orbits. Phoebe is one of those captured moons that has a retrograde inclined orbit. Uh, so that's, that's the family of moons. We now know of many more small moons in close to the rings as well. Titan is the biggest moon, is actually about the size of the planet Mercury. So if Titan had formed anywhere else in the solar system, Titan could have been a planet. Uh, most of the mass in the system from the moons is in Titan. In that last year of the mission, we got a close-up look at some of the tiniest <laughs> moons in the Saturn system including Atlas, Daphnis, and Pan. And Atlas orbits just outside the edge of the A-ring. Daphnis orbits right here in the Keeler Gap. And here's Pan orbiting in the Anki Gap. And what we noticed when we got these close-up views of these tiny moons is that they had this skirt of material, this ridge of basically ring particles that they've accumulated from the edge of the ring. So they've grown to the point where Saturn's gravity is balanced by the gravity of the moon. So they can't get any more skirt around them than what you see here. But it just was amazing to see these close up, highest resolution ever views. It looks like these worlds are probably have a tiny central icy shard, but are mostly rubble piles. They're very light, very under dense. About half the space in these moons is void space. Here's another view of Daphnis in the Keeler Gap. Daphnis is keeping the gap open, and you can see Daphnis is creating a wave much like a wave crashing on a beach. There's another wave to the other side on the right, but it's outside of this image. And these are the perturbations to the ring particles. If you look carefully, you can even see some of the ring particles that Daphnis has stolen away from the rings. A very, very high resolution view and some more of that sort of speckling or streakiness throughout the rings here around Daphnis as well. Here's a Titan. This is a view that we had from Voyager. And if you look in the visible, what you see is that Titan is an orange, hazy world. There's methane in Titan's atmosphere that's broken apart by sunlight, forms more and more complex hydrocarbons, basically smog. And one of Voyager's cameras couldn't see through to the surface. So one of the goals with Cassini was go back with the Huygens probe, with instruments that could unveil the surface of Titan. What does this world look like? So here's the Huygens probe. Uh, we dropped Huygens off on December 25th, 2004. A little more than two weeks later, uh, Huygens impacted the atmosphere of uh, Titan. Here you can see it's the sent altitude. The heat shield kicks in about 156 kilometers. The first parachute comes out. Little drogue chute pulls out this main parachute. We were only on the main parachute for about 15 minutes. That Titan's atmosphere is very thin high up. It gets denser. We only had about two and a half hours lifetime on our batteries. So we knew we had to reach the surface in two and a half hours. So we went to a, a second smaller chute 
about and spent most of the time going through Titan's atmosphere on that parachute. We had instruments to measure the pressure, temperature, and take images of the surface and impacted at five meters per second and actually was soft enough, Huygens kept sending data to Cassini. As Cassini was flying overhead, we got the full two and a half hours of the descent and another hour and 15 minutes of Huygens sitting on the surface. And the radio telescopes on Earth were actually able to listen to the signal for another three hours, so a little over three hours, as Huygens was still alive until the batteries finally cooled enough and were just out of power. So here I'm going to show you a movie in the final few kilometers as we're landing with the Huygens probe on the surface of Titan. As Huygens was spinning, this camera is snapping pictures. You can see evidence of what looks like river channels on the surface. It's still kind of hazy at the lower elevations and getting closer and closer to the surface until finally uh, the Huygens probe lands. And so coming back for the next hour and 12 minutes were this view of Titan's surface. We had landed in a dry stream bed. Those are rounded icy pebbles rounded by the flow of liquid methane. Turns out that the temperature of Titan's atmosphere, methane plays the role on Titan that water plays on the Earth. It can be a gas and form clouds. It can rain methane down to the surface. The methane can carve river channels and round pebbles like we see here. So very, just very interesting. Just this, this picture here told us so much about Titan. <coughs> and here's that view. Some of those pebbles in the foreground are maybe six or seven inches across. The color image comes because we had a lamp on board Huygens. And we could take a picture of the surface knowing the color of the lamp, then we knew how to colorize the, the whole image. Just for sc scale and to compare, you can see a, from the moon a picture here. Um, you can see a footprint. And here's someone standing next to the flag. We're looking off into the distance at the horizon of Titan. And on the right, you can see the river channels carved by the flow of methane going down into the region uh, where the Huygens probe landed. Well, at the North Pole of Titan, we discovered lakes and seas. And this is a, a radar image. We use radar to pierce through the haze and map good portions of the surface of Titan. That dark area is the methane sea. That Ligia Mare is about 50% larger than Lake Superior. And like Lake Superior, is about 500 feet deep. And so knowing the size and depth, we can add up all of the hydrocarbons, all the methane, ethane on Titan. Turns out it's about 100 times more than the estimated reserves we have here on the Earth. So we could only build a pipeline <laughs> long enough to go to Titan. Uh, our worries would be over. So it's just amazing to see the lakes and seas. Also saw dunes, those tiny particles rain down and you get long linear dunes around the equator, the driest region on Titan. Also saw evidence of mountains and this false color image, the pink is flow. Perhaps there's water cryovolcanoes that come out, spread the water and bring additional methane to replace what's broken apart in the upper atmosphere. Clouds is false color methane cloud. We actually saw it rain on Titan and wet a big portion of the surface, and then the dry uh, riverbeds that are there. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about tiny Enceladus. And here you see the Earth and the Moon and Enceladus for scale. And to give you an idea of the scale of Enceladus, here's Enceladus shown against Texas. Enceladus is only about 300 miles across, so a little bit more than the distance from Houston to Dallas. So it's a tiny world and yet one of the most interesting discoveries of the Cassini mission. Here's a view of Enceladus. What was really peculiar are these four bluish fractures at the South Pole. If you look at Enceladus, it's bright, icy, white, very few craters, no craters at the South Pole. It looks fresh and new. So something is going on with Enceladus. And actually, we had hints from our magnetometer data saying, you know, Enceladus kind of looks more like a comet than just a frozen solid moon. And we noticed that the South Pole was hot. Here's one of those fractures and most of the heat we saw coming out along these long linear tectonic fractures on the surface. They're quite long and two to four kilometers across. You can almost see like a, an icy coating on one edge of these fractures. It turns out that the answer came from jets. Coming out of these fractures are on the order of about 100 individual jets water vapor, water ice particles, ammonia, methane, 
and complex hydrocarbons, you get a better idea of those jets shooting out from the south pole of this tiny moon. This moon was active. We were, that was one of our biggest surprises, I think, of the mission. Here's another view. You can start to actually see the individual sources of the jets along some of those tiger stripes. And they were also salty. We saw sodium and potassium. And the saltiness was very similar to the saltiness of the Earth's oceans. So we have all of these organic compounds on this world. We also uh, found that many of the particles, most of them fall back, but some of them go on to create that bluish E-ring. So you can see here, tiny and cell, this is the black dot. Here's the plume. And here are these particles coming out and forming Saturn's E-ring. That E-ring goes all the way into Saturn and probably impacts Saturn's rings all the way out to the orbit of the giant moon Titan. We also discovered hydrothermal vents. It turns out that tiny grains of nanosilica were in those particles, and these grains can only grow in water very close to the boiling point. And so this was evidence of, as well as excess hydrogens, we were seeing something that resembled the hydrothermal vents on Earth. And if you look on the Earth, this is deep in the seafloor where the sun doesn't shine. There are these fractures in the Earth's seafloor. Water goes in and accumulates minerals and gets heated up. When it comes back out and hits the cold water, those minerals condense out. You kind of think of them like smoke particles or snow, creating these hydrothermal vents. And here deep in the ocean where it's dark and very cold, if we look near these vents on the Earth, we find islands of life tiny crabs and tube worms and, and all kinds of interesting life around these vents. So we wonder, could you perhaps have life in the ocean on Enceladus? And that's a question for a future mission to go back. Fly through those jets, collect samples, and maybe even take a microscope and say, hey, anything wiggly, anything in there? See what we might find. Finally, the grand finale, Cassini's final goodbye. And why crash into Saturn? Why did you have to, we have to end the mission in the first place? Well, Cassini was running out of fuel. And we discovered these two very interesting moons in particular, the liquid water ocean on Enceladus, these methane seas on Titan. And so as to protect these two worlds. We didn't want Cassini, once out of fuel, to accidentally run into one of these worlds. And we go back to look for life. And what do we find? Earth life, Earth bacteria. So with the hydrothermal vents on Enceladus and the methane seas on Titan, then NASA said, we need you to find a way to dispose of Cassini that would protect these particular worlds. So here are the 22 orbits of Cassini's grand finale. Once every six and a half days, we dove in between the rings and the planet, getting some of our best views of Saturn, best views of the rings, and also sampling that region between the rings and Saturn and how they're interconnected and actually skimming the top of Saturn's atmosphere. So on the last half orbit, we got a distant nudge from Titan. We called it Titan's goodbye kiss, and that sent us into the atmosphere of Saturn. Just briefly, some of the highlights. Here are some of the images from the very first flyby of the planet. Those white squares are the size of the images, and you can see by the end, we were just sampling just a very tiny fraction of the atmosphere, seeing clouds at resolutions that we hadn't seen them before, 100 times better than the previous pictures we had. So this is an overview of what we saw in the gap. We found a new radiation belt, currents flowing between the rings and Saturn, material falling in, including water, silicates, and a whole host of complex hydrocarbons falling into the equator from Saturn and other charged particles coming from the B and C rings that spiral along impact the atmosphere. We call it ring rain that we had seen previously. And also found that the magnetic field axis is almost perfectly aligned with the rotation axis. Here's some gravity results uh, for uniform rotation. That would have been the red symbols. That was our model. Instead, these black open and closed circles were our gravity data telling us that the winds of Saturn rotate at different speeds and that their depth had to be as deep as like 9,000 kilometers. So that was a very surprising finding. And looking at this graph, these are though what we can think of as J2, 3, 4, the gravitational harmonics and their strength. Since we flew between Saturn and the rings, we can separately measure now the mass of the rings, how much 
the rings pulled on the sp spacecraft and changed the signal. And we found that the mass was much lower than we had expected, and that pointed to very young rings, that which was a big surprise. Maybe the rings around Saturn, here's this planet four and a half billion years old. Maybe the rings are only 10 or 100 million years old. In fact, maybe the rings formed about the time of the dinosaurs. And perhaps we're just seeing one of many ring systems that Saturn had. Here's our final farewell image to Saturn. Uh, this series of pictures was taken about two days before the final plunge into the atmosphere. This is the final 90 seconds. Each of those dots is 10 seconds on that trajectory. We went into the atmosphere just a little bit north, uh, about 10 degrees north latitude. And here's what we watched in mission control. First, the X-band signal disappears. And then very slowly, the S-band signal disappears as the atmosphere gets so thick, it pulls the antenna away from the Earth. And Cassini very quickly burns up in the atmosphere. It was a, t a time of a tremendous success, but also of sadness. And this was an emotional goodbye of people basically saying goodbye to the Cassini spacecraft. And for me, it was the breakup of the Cassini team, all of us now going our own way on to different projects. Here's a picture of the Cassini team, all of us waving goodbye this time to the Cassini spacecraft uh, with that final flyby. And it, this is a picture of my daughters, Jessica, Jennifer, and my granddaughter, Audrey. That was Audrey's first big event uh, for a spacecraft, also uh, waving goodbye to the planet. Well, what happens you know, after you say goodbye to the, to the spacecraft? You keep looking at the data. You have to satisfy NASA requirements for paperwork for closeout. Uh, but other good things happen, too. It turns out about a year later that Cassini won an Emmy Award for its grand finale coverage. We were totally blown away. Our competition included Google and, and Disney Pixar. And we had some really you know, incredible competition. But I think it was our coverage. We had a set of cameras that gave you a 360 degree view of mission control. And you could drive those cameras to look around the room wherever you wanted to. And we think that part of that and just the social media campaign and uh, the, getting it out on the NASA channel, really engaging the world in the final uh, plunge for Cassini. It was great just to stand there. and We passed the Emmy around back and forth and said, wow, we have an Emmy Award. Wow. <laughs> so if you go to JPL and you look at the model of the Cassini spacecraft, you'll see in a, in a uh, case next to it our Emmy. <laughs> so quite cool. Uh, so what I want to show you in closing now is a movie uh, that basically taught, shows you some of the highlights and the wonders of Saturn. <laughs> 
see that movie, I say we have to go back. And who knows, maybe 50 years from now, it'll be part of a grand tour instead of a cruise. Maybe it'll be a chance to go back to Saturn. Thank you very much. The question is about the thickness of the rings and how thin they are. It really is truly amazing. Well, Saturn is a very oblate, squashed planet, and it's Saturn's gravity that keeps those ring particles confined. If they go too far, the, the oblateness of Saturn pushes them back. And it's also what we call a cold, classical disk. So there's not a lot of extra energy. The collisions are very gentle. There are places in the rings, you'll notice that we saw one and a half miles 50 years ago. There are some waves called bending waves that do go above and below the rings. We thought perhaps we saw the bending waves or maybe the thicker F ring to give us that earlier thickness. But 30 feet, perhaps even less, as we look at occultations. The, the occultations with the star, the edges in those gaps are very sharp within just a couple data points. Uh, they, it drops to zero. So it, it, is, it is amazing. What's the thoughts on the hexagon shape of the polar star, of the, at the North Pole? It is really intriguing. It's the only hexagonal jet stream we know of. We've run model simulations. You can treat the atmosphere like a fluid. And you can spin fluids, and sometimes you can create hexagons or pentagons or something. But they don't last very long. So why this jet stream? Well, you can see little waves coming off the, the edges. Why it's so stable, we don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a great, great PhD thesis, I think, for someone. <laughs> right here, yeah. Hi, um, you mentioned that you think the rings are really young because there was less mass than you expected. Does that mean you think the rings are growing in mass? And if so, where is the new material coming from? Uh, the question about the age of the rings, the, the mass of the rings is slowly decreasing. We know particles are going into Saturn. They're broken apart by micrometeoroid bombardment. The low mass tells us that they probably could not have survived being sort of eaten away for four and a half billion years plus the fact they're so bright and icy, the contamination over four and a half billion years would have probably made them much darker. So we're learning about the, the rates at which those particles come in. But they're getting less and less all the time. How does Saturn's radiation compare to Jupiter? Piece of cake at Saturn. Rings are like a giant blanket that basically absorb the radiation. So basically across the rings of Saturn, it's like a radiation-free zone. And so you do have radiation belts outside Saturn, but many, many, many tens of orders of magnitude less than you would have at Jupiter. The rotation rate of the rings. It turns out that the rings are just like the planets in our solar system. If you're a ring particle closer to Saturn, you'll go around faster. It might only take you eight or nine hours to go around. If you're all the way out at the A ring or the F ring, it might take you 14 or 15 hours. So the rings are differentially rotating. Closer to the planet, faster, further away, more slowly. Good question. On the picture of the equinox lighting of the edge of the ring, had these structures standing up above the ring, what were they? I think these structures are some of the largest ring particles. Could be agglomerations of ring particles, perhaps, or perhaps larger uh, parent bodies in the rings. We saw other places in the rings with shadows as well creating these objects we call propellers, where they're not quite big enough to open up a gap, but the two arms of the propellers are a start. So we know that there's a gradation of sizes in the ring. So we're not exactly sure if they're just large clumps or individual larger pieces. Maybe there was a small moon in the Cassini division broken apart, and those are the fragments. Uh, but they're just much, some of the biggest objects we saw besides Pan and Death. Ah, why don't other planets have rings? So it turns out if you look at the, the giant planets in our system, I said it 50 years ago, we just knew Saturn had rings. We now know from occultations, primarily from the Earth, uh, in the late 1970s, Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter all have rings. They just aren't as obvious and as easily viewed in a telescope as what you could see around Saturn. So all the giant planets have rings. And I wonder, what about exoplanets? Let's find some exoplanets with ring systems. We get some better statistics here. Ooh, next most interesting moon after Enceladus and Titan. 
As a ring scientist, I might pick one of the little ones with the skirts, but I think Iapetus. Iapetus is a moon further out in the system with the dark side and the bright side of material. And we wondered, was that dark material coming from inside Iapetus or something coating it from the outside? And it turns out with Cassini, we learned, uh, actually the, the Spitzer Space Telescope discovered that that moon Phoebe, with the retrograde inclined orbit far away from Saturn, was creating a ring. And that Phoebe dust was going into the system and preferentially coating one side of Iapetus. So just an interesting story. Also, Iapetus has this high ridge around its equator that's quite old because it's been peppered and eroded away with, with craters. And, and you, one explanation might be maybe Iapetus had a ring. And as that ring material fell in around the equator, it created the ridge on Iapetus. Because we now know there's other objects besides planets that can have rings. Chiriclo is one example in our own solar system of this object that has a, a pair of rings around it. So Iapetus has a nice story for a moon. Question is, some theories about the core of the planet. I didn't say a lot about that. It turns out that from the gravity measurements, we think that the core is about 15 to 18 Earth masses. We don't know if it's a solid core or if it's a, a more permeable core. I don't know that much about it. Uh, we know that to generate the magnetic field, you get down to a, a level that's very dense in the atmosphere where the hydrogen becomes metallic, actually works like a metal, and the currents can flow and generate the magnetic field. So we're learning, there's still more information out there in the gravity data and in the magnetic field data that we're still mining to figure out about the inside of Saturn. Two questions for you. How come you didn't get to take the Emmy home? <laughs> and, and the other question is, uh, a month ago or so, we had Fran Bagenal talking about Juno. And the end phase of Cassini, as you know, uh, was basically a sort of repetition of the, the Juno uh, scenario, where we got very close in trying to understand the, the core and, and the rest of, of uh, the interior of Cassini and other things. Do we understand yet the differences between Jupiter and Saturn from these data yet? Um, my understanding is that they're seeing a lot of differences. I'm wondering if you can uh, say a few words maybe about that. Right, right. Well, with the Emmy, I would have loved to take it home, but there was only one Emmy and a lot of people wanting it. So, and so it stays with the Cassini spacecraft. As far as Jupiter and Saturn, yes, the orbits were very similar. Uh, when it comes to the gravity data in particular, the winds on Jupiter go down to about 3,000 kilometers. It's about three times as much, 9,000 kilometers at Saturn and probably some different mechanisms going on. Uh, Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted on its side, and that seems to bode well. It works well with the theories of magnetic field. Saturn, with the two axes, the spin axis and the magnetic field axis, almost co-aligned, is a puzzle, because our theories tell us that that field shouldn't exist. So are we seeing a dying field at Saturn? Or probably, most likely, our theories need a tune-up to be able to explain more about Saturn. And so we're still probing in and comparing these two worlds that appear very similar in many ways. And yet, when you get down to the details, either with your atmospheres and their interiors, uh, they're quite different. For instance, Jupiter doesn't have a hexagon. Take one more question up there. What challenges did you experience with the spacecraft during the years that it was? What were the challenges with the spacecraft? Well, we were very lucky in that we had very few problems with the spacecraft. Every once in a while, there would be a, a bit error or something. A command wouldn't go up quite right. And Cassini would essentially go into safety. And you can imagine Cassini kind of shutting off all the instruments and sort of curling up and saying to the Earth, help, help. And then we'd figure out what was wrong, send commands up to correct it, and then send Cassini on its way. We lost uh, some of the sensors and some of the instruments. Uh, Cassini's uh, most important computers and most important resources were fully redundant. And we didn't have to use any of that redundancy really on Cassini. So we, we had a very healthy, very healthy spacecraft. Just re we needed a refueling tank to get up there. Thank you very much.